Marcus Davenport did a lot more than just show that he could stay healthy and play most of a game. My dude, Cooked, welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast. You liked it on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked on Vikings podcast, where we try to learn something new every single day. I am your host, Luke Braun. Thank you so much for making the Locked on Vikings your first listen of the day each and every single day. You can find the show wherever you find your favorite podcast, whether it's any like podcast listening app, anywhere where podcasts are aggregated, including the SiriusXM app. You can also go to SiriusXM and listen to live broadcasts of games like Vikings Chiefs if you maybe uh, want to try to combat the Romo curse or something like that. Uh, you can also find the show on YouTube or even Amazon Fire and Roku. Just download the Locked on Minnesota Sports app. Today is uh, Wednesday, and that means that this is the time when I get to dump all of my super nitty gritty uh, football film X's and O's ass takes on you. And the first one is that Marcus Davenport had an absolutely fantastic game. He had so many disruptive reps. I have a Patreon post that I am working on here and just counting it up. I have pulled 10 reps up that I thought he was one of, if not the sole disrupting factor in the play. Um, It was an awesome game. And it wasn't just a couple of sacks or the, the like sacks that weren't right. It wasn't just those plays. And in fact, the actual thing that gets logged as a sack for him, and this is very Marcus Davenport. I don't even think it was like his best play. I, it was, it took a long time. It was more of a coverage sack. Um, There were so many other moments where he he beat an offensive lineman faster than that and got in and, you know, Bryce Young either got the ball away or for whatever other reason, it didn't actually turn into something. Sometimes he would absolutely cook a guard, but it was like on the wrong side of the play on a bubble screen. It's like, all right, we got there. Um, Very Marcus Davenport luck where his best plays always did seem to come against like quick game. And there might be a reason for that as I think through it. Um, so maybe the, the superpower of Marcus Davenport, the thing that makes him a starting NFL player that made him a guy, the saints wanted to trade two first round picks for so many years ago is that his hands are very fast. He has some of the best hands in the league as a pass rusher. Um, and that'll only take you so far. And I think that like, look in new Orleans, that wasn't enough sometimes. And I get it, but his hands are really, really good. And they're really motivated. Um, There was a play elsewhere in the game. Andre Carter got a couple of reps. And there was a play where Andre Carter got just pancaked. I mean, just killed. Uh, And it was because he was trying to swim. And his hands are a lot slower than Marcus Davenport's, right? He's a a raw rookie. Um, One of the things that a lot of people teach, and this is controversial, among defensive line coaches. So I apologize for stepping out of line and taking a stand here, but I hate when D line coaches teach it, uh, the swim move as a two move thing. I think it needs to be a three move thing. And I, I've, I've argued this on Patreon too. Patreon.com slash Luke Ron NFL, by the way, for like video examples of all this stuff too, because I can actually use tape on there. Um, so typically for me, a swim move has to start with, One hand chopping the arms away. It has to start with a chop. Another hand punches. And so it's usually your outside hand that punches. Your inside hand chops the arms away or swipes the arms away or swipes the arms up. Your, Your first move needs to be to get rid of that offensive lineman's arms. Your second move is a punch to the shoulder. And then your third move is the swim or the actual, it it doesn't even have to be a high swim. It's just like, get your, your arm over him. Um, I think it needs to be a, like a, like a three move thing. Some people think that takes too long and they say, don't bother with chopping the O-line's arms, just punch and swim. And I hate that because it exposes your ribs to, uh, really big punches. It really, it exposes your whole midsection to, mean finishy punches from guards like Christian Derrissaw or or tackles like Christian Derrissaw guards like Ed Ingram that want to punch you so hard in the 
gut that you fall over, right? And this is what happened to, to Andre Carter in that rep. Marcus Davenport can like get away with that kind of thing because he's so quick with his hands that his midsection isn't exposed for long enough for offensive linemen to react unless they're really timing this out. Um, it makes life a lot easier. And we saw a lot of that on display and just a lot of tenacity and effort and motor. Honestly, like he was just as disruptive as, as Daniel Hunter in this game. And I don't, it wasn't peak Daniel Hunter. So don't freak out at me too much for that take. But in this particular game for that 60 minutes of football, Marcus Davenport was one of the most disruptive guys on the field. And the only problem was that he wasn't on the field the whole time, probably for pitch count reasons, right? For health reasons. Um, and it like when he came off the field and it was Wanham or Patrick Jones, the defense legit got a lot worse. I think Davenport's impact on the team is really apparent in this game. And now the question becomes, will that continue or was it just one good game? And let's try not to take one good game and project it out and extrapolate it out to the sun, right? Good game. Marcus Davenport. We love to see it. Let's see some more of them. Um, I also want to get into, uh, well, I guess I can sort of muse on the defense a little bit. Um, Ivan Pace, probably the best linebacker on the team still. It's kind of wild that we're saying that. Uh, I, I thought Jordan Hicks and Ivan Pace both had some rough moments in coverage, but Pace still reacting very quickly, playing really strong for a guy of his stature, right? Um, he, 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 he is a strong linebacker. He just doesn't like stand tall, like big, scary linebackers like Anthony Barr. Um, but I, I think one of the things that caused a lot of those like in breaking routes over the middle to like Adam Thielen and stuff that, that moved the ball on the Vikes a little bit was, uh, just linebackers and D line dropping back into coverage, kind of getting exploited when blitzes didn't get home. And then just sometimes, yeah, it's just that they're kind of watching the QB's eyes and those guys can get looked off. It's just going to be something that can happen to you. And that's why we sort of have to blitz to make up for it. Um, and it's when we didn't blitz last year and that stuff was happening, right. Then it was a catastrophe on the secondary, a uh, really good game for the secondary. Um, Fantastic stuff from outside of like two or three select reps. Like there was one time Byron Murphy got beat on. He just kind of got caught sleeping late in a rep. There was one uh, illegal contact on a Caleb Evans that personally I think is kind of BS. Um, I mean, it's clearly it is clearly contact downfield, but typically you need a more of an extension than that to actually get called. And I'm not talking about PI. I'm talking about illegal contact because there's catch technique. There is a technique where a cornerback just sort of accepts the contact, but you have to just like not push back. Uh, and I didn't think Caleb Evans did that bad of a job doing that. Um, like you as the cornerback have a right to your spot as well. You just have to like take the charge when you're doing catch technique. And I thought he did a good enough job of that, but it's a subjective matter and he got his penalty, whatever. Um, Outside of those plays, I thought he was fine. I thought Metellus had a really, really good game, especially as a pass rusher, which is very funny. Obviously, Harrison Smith had the Harrison Smith game. Similarly to Davenport, I think the best Harrison Smith plays in this one weren't the sacks. Uh, there were some other moments in the run where, I mean, it's subtle and it's a smaller impact. You know, it's it's not a, a big flashy play, but I think it's more skillful. And it was really cool to see that from Harrison Smith, who kind of had had a quiet year up to, up to that game. Uh, and then, of course, Cam Bynum who, I mean, look, like, Cam Bynum is just a good starting safety. Like, there's no caveats on this anymore. He's not good for a rookie. He's not good for, you know, well, yeah, but considering the circumstances, like, he just, he's good, man. Like, he he's, he's playing so confidently. He's playing with his feet flat, and he's driving on things underneath. He is playing safety the way that Harrison Smith played safety in 2021. When you look at Cam Bynum next to him, or... um who was, was this? It, it wasn't still Anthony Harris. Who's the other safety when it wasn't Cam Bynum? Uh, was it the return of Sandejo? I forget. But like you could kind of see last year when they were in quarters, uh, Cam Bynum would back off so much more than Harrison Smith. You could see Harrison Smith playing so much more confidently. Bynum is now playing just as confidently uh, and giving himself less cushion, which means he can drive and break on things faster. And the risk is if you're wrong, you get torched. But He's, he's not wrong. He's playing fast and right. That's what we want. I'm so happy with Cam Bynum, and I honestly, I'm, I'm ready to start talking extension. Let's 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 get this guy in the building and make him a starter. I'm, I'm there for it. Um, 
Let's uh, flip over to the offense, though, because Davenport is not the only free agent signing that the Vikings had that absolutely cooked against the Carolina Panthers. And I want to make sure that I shout all those guys out and then just kind of address the major question, a big, big topic in the YouTube comments uh, after the Vikings got their first win, which was. Does it matter that we beat a bad team? How do you parse that out? Let's have that conversation, too. Today's episode is brought to you by eBay Motors, and eBay Motors has teamed up with Locked On Fantasy Football and host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks all week, from starts and sits to waiver wire pickups. And this week, we are talking about some get-right games. In particular, how about Aaron Jones, who is uh, coming off of kind of a, a stinker, against the Lions. He was on something of a pitch count on a short week, and A.J. Dillon didn't have... I mean, the Packers just didn't have a good game, right? Um, maybe with a little bit more of time to heal and a little bit more explosiveness and a, and a softer defensive opponent in the Raiders, uh, this could be a week where Aaron Jones goes off. So if you are an Aaron Jones owner in fantasy football, maybe don't give up on this thing, and uh, we'll see if the Packers can get that run game going again. But of course, in my heart of hearts, I do not want them to, even though I too am an Aaron Jones fantasy owner. Uh, but hey, look, it's all about trying to fit all of those pieces of information together and make sure you got the right thing going. eBay Motors understands that, and they understand that it's also a, uh, that that's the case for your car as well. They have over 122 million parts for your car and you can make sure that your car stays running smoothly. Brake kits, uh, LED headlights if you're into that, roof rack, bumpers, or even stuff under the hood. Um, whatever your car needs, or maybe whatever you want for it, uh, you can find at eBay Motors. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, they've got a whole system that can help you make sure that whatever part you're buying is actually correct and compatible with your car, which can be a total jungle to navigate. So go to ebaymotors.com and look for the eBay Guaranteed Fit. It's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. Hey, thanks again for making Lockdown Vikings your first listen of the day. Uh, if you are done with this and you want more Vikings content, head on over to patreon.com slash NFL, where you can already find a, uh, an offensive line hype tape which is what I'm going to talk about next. And I'm also working on a Davenport one that will kind of back up some of the stuff I just talked about. Um, but yeah, man, offensive line in the run game, absolutely cooked. And they had their job made easier by a tendency that the Vikings exploited. I think the Vikings did a very good job preparing for the Panthers. And not to get too far ahead of myself, because I will talk a little bit more about like, oh, well, but it was just the Panthers. Um, but up front... That's Derek Brown, Shy Tuttle's no slouch, Brian Burns. Like, they got dudes up front. Um, Justin Houston, who's, I mean, wild, old but wily, right? Uh, they, they've got some dudes up front in Carolina, and I think that matchup against the Vikings offensive line was probably figuring to be the worst mismatch in the, in the Panthers' favor all day. And the Vikings won that matchup. And I think that that is the thing that swung the game more than anything else, more than fluky plays and luck and all that stuff. The fact that the Vikings O-line hung with that very, very good Carolina defensive line. And part of the reason they were able to do that was that, so the Panthers see a lot of zone running, right? We all do. Uh, zone running's everywhere. And since zone running always starts with a lineman getting steps laterally to try to overtake a defensive lineman, right? They're trying to go from left to right or right to left. Um, that means that as a defensive line, if you want to hold in the same gap that you lined up in, you kind of have to flow with that action. If they step to the left, I also have to step with them, right? As a defensive lineman. Uh, and a lot of the Carolina defensive line had that habit and it made them better against zone runs because it was that much harder to reach them. They would slash almost like a gap across, like they were trying to get into the next gap over, but because that gap was moving at the same speed they were, they were just kind of staying in the spot they were supposed to stay in, and it made for sound run defense. But, and when I did a, a scouting episode on Patreon that I did for, for this game, and I watched the Saints, the Saints do a lot more like gap scheme stuff than the Vikings do. And every time they did gap scheme stuff, you could kind of see that the defensive line would just flow whichever way the offensive line in front of them was flowing. 
Like that is clearly their coaching point was if he steps lateral, you step lateral. If he pulls, you go with him. Um, and that felt super exploitable. The way the Vikings ran the ball was a lot of that, um, I'm going to call it duo, but I also have seen it called zone cut, but it's the one where the Vikings offensive line will flow all the way to the right, but the running back will take the handoff to the left and then run behind two tight ends that are there. So it's actually a strong side run play, but the, the, the run action flows to the weak side. So you're flowing the entire defense away from the run action, and you can you kind of know that they're going to because that's what they do on tape all day. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Um, now, the Vikings also did get some pretty banging zone runs, and they just sort of overcame that extra lateral motion anyways, and credit to them. Good job, you did it. Uh, but there were other times where they didn't have to do it, where their job was actually to down block a guy that's already moving the direction you need him to go. So just kind of keep escorting him along and congratulations you get to win your block and hey as the big guys up front don't make any apologies for that we take those all day thank you for your nine yards and we'll line up on second and one and then go throw a touchdown to justin jefferson <laughs> um very cool stuff in the run game and i can commend just about every player involved uh from everybody up front Darisaw, cleveland schlopman had great moments uh ingram had great moments Brian O'Neill might have been the best lineman on the field for the Vikings. Uh, I, I don't know about that. Probably still Darisaw. You know, the the tight ends as well. Munt even had had some moments. Hawkinson is a blocker. Ups and downs, but plenty of ups. Um, but truly, the guy that steals the show on the run game tape, tape was Josh Oliver. Uh, Josh Cohen, who is a very good... Uh, Jay Cohen, I think there's an underscore NFL on Twitter. Uh, fantastic account to follow um posted a cut up of all of the crazy josh oliver blocks in this one and it is i mean you're you'll be sweating by the end of it uh it is fantastic it is truly incredible um and and i want to kind of revisit the idea of like man why'd they sign a blocking tight end bam there it is so that you can be mismatched on o-line versus d-line but still run the ball uh it, because josh oliver is just kicking that much ass um gross matos that's the other guy on the on the on the Panthers. That's, that's a respectable player that should have been able to be more productive, but we played really well. Having a guy that can be a tight end that can, Hey, you know, catch a flash, catch a stupid dump off on a rollout and, you know, turn it upfield and run fine, but also functionally be a sixth lineman in the run game is so useful. <laughs> There's so much utility to it, uh, that the contract that he signed in the off season, I had no reservations about it at all. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention on the offense was Kirk's game. Uh, look, I, I think that Kirk's game is truly defined by that pick six. There was a, a, a stat that I had on the Minnesota football party that uh, of his EPA, his total EPA, his total expected points added, i.e. his impact on the game statistically, was minus 10.3. Uh, so Kirk Cousins cost the Vikings 10 points is essentially what that stat is saying. Minus 11.3 of that belongs to the pick six on that snag concept um, now down near the goal line because that was an opportunity to score a touchdown that turned into touchdown Panthers. 11.3 points is what the models say that that cost them. So if you remove that, he actually had a decent day. Uh, I think that that's fair, and I also think that it's totally fair to characterize the game that way because that was one mistake that really broke a lot of things open. And in the first half, there was still a lot of hesitation and it was still very slow. It wasn't like bizarre turndowns. It wasn't why is he checking down or anything like that. It was like you could see the decisions he was making. It was all just slow. There was just always a little bit of a beat too much. And this is also a game for Cousins where, look, we don't expect him to be mobile, but it's sort of always in the back of my head of would a more mobile QB have been able to, to avoid that pressure or would have been able to escape that pocket and make something happen? You know, not not I'm not asking you to be Mahomes, right? I'm not asking you to go be Jalen Hurts or anything like that. But hey, would would Stafford have made that play? You know, <laughs> somebody that that runs around just a little bit more. Um, it's not Kirk style and we shouldn't like raise an expectation that it should be Kirk's style, but it's always something to keep in mind. And I think this is one where there were a couple of moments where, boy, a little mobility would have been great 
or just a little bit of a sidestep would have been great. I, I actually think the other interception, the Ed Ingram one, very much Ed Ingram's fault. Way more Ed Ingram's fault than Kirk Cousins is. But I don't think it's unreasonable to go into the quarterback room later and say, hey, man, you could have stepped to the side a little bit and delivered a better ball there. Because Jordan Addison was going to be a, was going to be one on one on a five foot ten slot corner for a touchdown, and that's what he was trying to throw. Um, it, like and it, and it could have been there, like it was would have been a jump ball for Jordan Addison, and you know we'll take our chances there. Uh, I don't know the like I I know I'm like kind of asking him to be somebody that he isn't, but that is something we have to consider when we're talking about him getting older and are we going to commit to more years of him that's always going to be framed as part of the conversation today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel America's number one sports book and if you want to get into a good old gramble maybe you're watching the twins who congratulations on their first playoff win since Ronald Reagan died <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want to dig at the Twins. It's a good day to be a Twins fan. But if you're going to watch some more baseball, maybe you're not really a baseball fan, you need a little side action to stay engaged, that is what FanDuel is for. You can also, of course, bet on things like how many yards Justin Jefferson will get, spreads, over-unders, all the lines, and all kinds of wacky prop bets. I'm sure we'll have some fun ones with Travis Kelsey, uh, with probably Taylor Swift coming to the U.S. Bank Stadium, too. Uh, just go to FanDuel.com, and if you're new... You, all you got to do is make a $5 bet at FanDuel.com slash locked on and you get $200 in bonus bets added to your account just for making the $5 bet. Win or lose that $5 bet. You don't even have to win it. You still get your $200 in bonus bets. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. Their app is safe, secure, and super easy to use and they pay out instantly when you win. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. Folks, let's have a personal conversation. Dim the lights, uh, you know, light a candle, make it atmospheric, put on some smooth jazz, and let's let's heart to heart. Uh, why do we as a fan base go so hard against moral victories? It is so forbidden as a Vikings fan to say something like, man, hey, they went toe to toe with the Eagles. That feels pretty good, even though they didn't win. Why is that so disallowed? But it's the most popular thing in the world. And if you don't believe me, read the YouTube comments on the Monday episode of Locked On Vikings uh, recapping the win. It's maybe the most common thought a Vikings fan will have that when they beat a bad team, well, pff, it was just the Panthers. That doesn't actually prove anything. They're not good. They just beat the Panthers. Everybody beats the Panthers. I don't know why there is such a double standard that moral defeats are the pinnacle of an... Oh, hey, man, you know, losses are losses. Close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades, right? But when it's a victory that can be discredited similarly, we're going to be all over it. I don't know why we do that. I, and, and people who do that, I don't know, maybe you do both. Maybe maybe it's it's just that I, I, I hear a lot from both sides and I, and I mistake it that it's the same people maybe there are people that are just like, hey, you know, beating the Panthers, not that impressive. Losing to the Eagles, not that big a deal. Um, but I don't know. Like, if the Vikings get close to the Chiefs, take a take stock of how much you'll see, um, oh, man, you know, good job. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Chiefs versus how much people are just going to lament that they're 1-4 and four and ask them to tank, right? Personally, I think the scoreboard is a scoreboard. I, I think that, you know, the Vikings, yeah, they got close to the Eagles and there's lots of stuff from that game that we can look at and enjoy and, you know, have some fun with, right? Find your joy. But you don't get the win back just because you got close and you don't give the loss back just because they got close, right? Um, you, you you don't get to do that. That the, the, the record is the record. And the way I see it is like, look, we can do all these other things, project them moving forward. We can look at all the, you know, analytics that we want and win probability things. And we can try to make us a, a sensible projection forward. If that's what we're interested in doing, right. If you're trying to make a futures bet on the Vikings or something. Um, but for me personally, I, whenever I look at a game like this, where you go, man, they just squeaked one out against like the worst team. Uh, and then I go watch the tape and I see all this stuff that looks phenomenal. Like, man, okay, Marcus Davenport kicked ass. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Marcus Davenport wrecked shot 
in this game. Josh Oliver wrecked shop in this game. Strength of competition be damned. That dude cooked. Uh, and there's other stuff that didn't go as well, right? Um, Kirk Cousins wasn't as good. There was swinging, you know, ball security issues. Ed Ingram had five or six plays that I didn't like from him, which is far too many. If you feel the need to aggregate that into like a, I give them a C plus for the day kind of grade, then I guess go do it. I'm not going to really say anything like that though. That's not what I'm going to do. I just don't find it useful or really that fun. Um, so I don't really do that kind of thing here. And so when we're talking about strength of competition, that's usually a caveat to some sort of aggregated metric. Like, Hey, yeah, they had really good DVOA in week four, but it was against the Panthers. Uh, and I forget if DV, I don't think DVOA is opponent adjusted. Maybe it is. And that's the entire point of it. I forget. Um, but like, Hey, you know, they had great, they, they really limited the Panthers to a low EPA per play. I screened in, I, I tweeted out a screenshot of that, of like the, the statistical, I mean, the, the Panthers offense was a catastrophe in that game. And every comment was like, yeah, but it's the Panthers, right? And sure, if you're going to look at a raw stat like that, you should probably adjust for strength of competition. Um, but when I'm talking about, man, Josh Oliver laid down an awesome block on Brian Burns. I don't really care that Brian Burns' team is 0-4. <laughs> like, that's Brian Burns. We know he's good. And that's a great block that whoever just, you know, laid down on him. Um, and even beyond that, the reputations of these guys don't come on the field with him. At that point, he's just number zero. And yeah, we expect him to make a lot of good plays, but did he make one there? What if Brian Burns tripped and fell and you got to win a block that way, right? That's not really beating Brian Burns. So you can't really count that as, you know, oh, you got a great block on Brian Burns. But if he did a good job and he, you know, did a nasty bull rush and you anchored against it, oh, good job. You just you just held up to Brian Burns at his best. I think that's a, a, a better way to incorporate strength of competition is, is to be a little bit more common sense and logical about it, unless you're like trying to really do like iterative math, which is a whole other world I won't get into. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on this is the idea that the Vikings just squeaked out of this one, I don't think is particularly correct. I know it was a one score game, but the one score cutoff is very arbitrary. Um, and, and we talked about this a ton last year, right? An eight-point loss is not the same as an eight-point win. We cannot look at those two games and say, eh, well, those were probably coin flips together, right? Those are about the same. And really, just luck was the difference, right? I don't think you can look at that that way. Um, There's a lot of difference in, you know, the the Vikings losing against the Giants, for example, and the Vikings winning this game. Like, the difference between who was outplaying who in those games. Like, the Vikings did not get unlucky in that Giants game. They got, they got their butts whooped on defense. And their offense kept pace barely. But they got whooped in that game. I truly think that that score lies to you about how close that that playoff game was. And I think the score is lying to you about how close this game was, too. And part of that is... Eight points in particular is a is like a pretty sinister score when we're talking about one score game neeness, because if you look at win probability, um, which is probably a better model for like how close was this game at the end, right? Like how how dicey was it getting there at the end? Uh, and if you look at any win probability model, they all had the Vikings well over 80 percent by the time the, the Panthers were in that last drive and they were goal to go. And the models were basically saying, yeah, whatever. And the reason for that is. The, the Panthers would have had to score, which they failed to do, but let's say they succeeded and they scored. They would have also had to get a two-point conversion, which is roughly a 50-50 proposition, and they would have then had to stop the Vikings on the way back. We'll call that a 50-50 proposition just to keep the math easy. And then they would have had to win in overtime. So even if you grant them the touchdown they did not get, then they would have had to win three coin flips in a row, Right. Um, if you count overtime, a two-point conversion in that final drive as coin flips, which is reductive, but we're keeping the math easy, right? For those counting at home, that's a that's that's a one out of eight chance. It's like 12% for all those things to happen. And that's after we grant them a touchdown that they did not get. So by the time it was third and 18, fourth and 18, and getting a touchdown looked really, really hard, and they needed to string together like three more successes to win the game. Yeah, that's not really that close. Um 
And so I don't think this game was that close, to be honest. And maybe that's just going to read to a bunch of people as trash talk or homerism or whatever. But I don't think that game was that close. I, I don't think the Eagles game was a one-score game, really, right? Like, if you need me to, to say this on the other side, I'm more than happy to. Losing to the Eagles by, what was it, six at the end? Nah, they got whooped by the Eagles. Come on. Like, the Eagles were, were just better. Um, and that's also part of why I'm never going to be like, oh, they went toe-to-toe. Like, nah, y'all lost. All right, scoreboard. Uh, they didn't lose just barely to the Giants. They didn't just like barely get it squeaked. That fourth and eight was not a 50-50 proposition to win or lose the game. They would have had to finish that drive and not get stalled again. They would have had to then stop the Giants on the way back, and they would have had to win in overtime. Like, it's the same thing, right? They didn't win that game. They got beat, and it's probably more productive to look at all the reasons why, which is what the Vikings did, and then they retooled the whole defense into a unit that absolutely cooked on Sunday. So I don't know. the the This kind of all oh, they squeaked by the Panthers thing rings pretty hollow to me. I don't think that it's logically very good, and I'd much rather focus on, hey, man, Mark Davenport killed it, and I think that's the headline from the day for me. Um, that's going to kind of do it for the Panthers game though. We're, we're on to chiefs mode now. So tomorrow locked on chiefs crossover Thursday. And then on Friday, we'll do our bold predictions. We'll have lots of fun with that. I'm sure. Cause this is going to be a crazy one. I'll see you all tomorrow. And as always skull.